I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy Podcast, sponsored by The Brain Gauge, developed by neuroscientists at the University of North Carolina to study brain function across a wide range of applications, including aging and traumatic brain injury. The Brain Gauge translates state-of-the-art neuroscience into easy-to-use methods that let you take control of your brain health. Now available for home, research, and clinical applications. Find out more at gageyourbrain.com. Women's sexual difficulties have not gotten the same serious attention as men's problems. Will there ever be Viagra for women? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. A woman's sex drive may vary depending on whether she's pregnant, breastfeeding, menopausal, or taking certain prescription medications. Do health professionals alert their female patients to potential sexual side effects? Testosterone is perceived as a male hormone, but it also plays a crucial role in female sexuality. What are the pros and cons of testosterone supplementation? Can women anticipate a satisfying sex life after menopause? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, learn what you should know about women's sexual health. First, this news. In The People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, recurrent urinary tract infections cause a tremendous amount of pain and frustration. Doctors usually prescribe antibiotics to treat them. As a result, some women may end up taking several courses of antibiotics each year. Now, a study shows that a simple lifestyle change can make an important difference in the number of infections a woman might experience. The participants in this study were women who had recurrent urinary tract infections and who normally drank less than six glasses of water daily. The investigators randomly chose half of the women to continue with their usual water drinking habits. The other half were asked to double the amount of water they drank. During the next year, those who increased their water consumption had, on average, 1.7 urinary tract infections. Those who had not increased their water intake had 3.2 infections on average. Women who are able to drink 2 or 3 liters of water daily may have less trouble with recurrent UTIs and should therefore need fewer antibiotics. Surgical repair of meniscal tears is a common orthopedic procedure for knee pain. Over half a million arthroscopic partial meniscectomies are performed annually in the United States. But over the last six years, several studies have reported that this surgery was no better than physical therapy or sham surgery when it came to knee function. A question that remained unanswered, however, was whether the benefits of physical therapy would persist. Researchers in the Netherlands recruited 321 patients who were diagnosed with meniscal tears. They were randomly assigned to receive surgery or physical therapy. After two years, about a third of the patients who did physical therapy had surgery after all, but there was no significant difference between the groups with respect to knee function. The investigators conclude that physical therapy is a reasonable alternative to surgery for certain common meniscal tears. Artificial sweeteners are extremely popular since they appear to allow us to break the rules and enjoy sweet drinks or treats without gaining weight. The FDA has approved a number of artificial sweeteners, and most people assume that these products are quite safe. A new study suggests, however, that compounds such as aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, and azosulfame potassium may harm the bacteria that live in our digestive tracts. The researchers working in Israel and Singapore discovered that six such non-nutritive sweeteners slow the reproduction of bacteria that light up in the presence of toxins. The indicator bacteria showed luminescence even at low levels of sweetener. Ten sports supplements containing artificial sweeteners were also toxic to these bacteria. Since we rely on bacteria for all sorts of health benefits, The research raises the possibility that artificial sweeteners might also be bad for us over the long run. Osteoporosis is due to a loss of bone mass and strength. It greatly increases the chance of fractures that can lead to a loss of mobility. This condition is usually treated with bisphosphonate, such as alendronate. 
But questions about safety and long-term effectiveness have discouraged doctors from prescribing such drugs as frequently as they once did. Now, a carefully done study from New Zealand shows that older women with bone loss can benefit from treatment with zoledronate, an injectable bisphosphonate. The scientists recruited 2,000 women at least 65 years old with osteopenia. Over the course of six years, these volunteers got injections every 18 months of zoledronate or placebo. At the end of the study, significantly fewer of the women getting zoledronate had fragility fractures in their spines or elsewhere in their bodies. The investigators are enthusiastic about the potential for this treatment to reduce fractures among older women, but they caution that these findings should not be applied to women under 65 years old. Last year's flu season was brutal. The CDC estimates that 80,000 Americans died from influenza. The preceding flu season in the Southern Hemisphere had also been especially rough. That makes the news this year encouraging. The flu season has been much less severe in the Southern Hemisphere. We don't know if that will mean an easier flu season for us, though. Only time will tell. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Grayton. And I'm Terry Grayton. Today, we're starting with a disclaimer. Our topic is women's sexual health. Although there is nothing prurient about our discussion, it may not be appropriate for all audiences. We will be talking about body parts and clinical situations that might be unsuitable for children. There's been a great deal of attention to men's sexual difficulties, especially erectile dysfunction. Low libido and other sexual problems women experience have not gotten the same focus from the pharmaceutical industry or regulators for the Food and Drug Administration. Nonetheless, there are approaches that can be helpful. No woman should have to suffer in silence and assume nothing can be done. To learn more about improving women's sexual health, we turn to Dr. Sarah Gottfried. She's a Harvard-educated medical doctor and board-certified gynecologist with more than 25 years of experience. She's found that an integrative approach often works well to manage this type of problem. Her books include The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Thank you. So happy to be here. Dr. Gottfried, women's sexuality is a topic that, boy, it really gets people excited one way or the other, which wasn't so much the case with Viagra. When Viagra came out, oh, man, it was like, oh, this is wonderful, made the magazine covers. It was supposed to you know, save human sexuality, well, male sexuality. Then along came Addie. And I don't even, Terry, how did they spell that? I think it's spelled A D D Y I. Does that sound right, Dr. Gottfried? Yes. Yes. And it, it was like a uh, female Viagra, that was all the headlines. There is no such thing as a female Viagra. And it kind of fizzled. I mean, it was not anywhere near as exciting and popular as Viagra. What happened? Well, I would say Addie is the party that nobody came to. And you're right that men were super excited about Viagra. It's created a a renaissance for men, but it's also created a total mismatch among sexual partners, male and female sexual partners, in terms of the men having what they need to age and uh, maintain their pharmaceutically enhanced penis. But there's also a lot of interpersonal blowback and misunderstanding and hurt that's happened in this Viagra generation. So with Addie, you know, I'm a gynecologist. I prescribe and treat women with low libido and other sexual issues. And I was really underwhelmed by the research. So I haven't prescribed it. And as I said, I think it's it's the party that no one has come to. I think uh, there are other gynecologists who may have come to the same conclusions, but a discrepancy between partners in terms of sexual interest can be a real problem in a relationship, can't it? It certainly can. I mean, I think of, of low sex drive as being a couple's issue. It's not a male issue with just, you know, something like, um, 
erectile dysfunction. It's not purely a female issue as women go through perimenopause and menopause and have the attendant hormonal changes that occur. It's a couple's issue. And so when you're thrown out of sync by a pharmaceutical like Viagra, it really requires that we take a step back and kind of look at what's happening within that couple. And how do we support and goal set and figure out how we can make that that man and woman feel the best that they can feel as they get older? One of the areas that is rarely discussed because it seems counterintuitive to a lot of people is low male libido. On our website, we have received hundreds, if not thousands of messages over the years from women who say, you know, my partner just doesn't seem interested. And, you know, I'm in my 20s or my 30s. I'm an attractive woman. I exercise. And he just, he's just not interested. Well, here is an example. This message came from Karen in Western Australia. She says, my husband and I have been together for 26 years. I'm 55. He's 48. Yesterday morning, after three months of no sex, he woke up needing sex. And you can imagine what my libido was like. My body reacted before I even knew we were at it. 30 seconds later, that was it. All over. I'm still hanging. Now we're in the throes of a massive argument, and I'm at my wit's end. What can I do? So that was her comment. We don't know what to tell her, but they have a problem, don't they? Well, you know, I think this maps onto so many issues for a couple. It's the sex that happens to be the portal for why this woman raised this comment. But it also relates to the physiology of aging on both sides, the communication that's happening, the, you know, the level of um, not just the sexual act, which I think of as intercourse, but what's happening before the intercourse and what's happening afterwards. So it sounds like she's not satisfied. He may or may not be satisfied. There needs to be, you know, kind of a clearing of the relationship here. I wonder why men in their 20s, 30s, 40s, when you would think that their libido would be at the absolute peak, a great many seem, shall we say, uninterested or unwilling. Do you have any idea what's going on? Well, first, I have to say I'm a board certified gynecologist, so I'm not an expert at men's health. But I can tell you, you know, after studying the human body for the past 25 to 30 years, I think there's an epidemic of a problem upstream. So the way I think about it as someone who practices integrative and functional medicine is that there's a control system for sex And about 70% of it is related to hormones. And if you have someone, whether it's a male or a female, who has a high level of perceived stress, that's then going to rob you of the sex hormones that are at the foundation of a healthy sex drive. So for a man, the more stressed you are, the more that you make cortisol, the main stress hormone, that's going to lower your testosterone. And for a woman, the more stress that you are, the more cortisol that you make, that's going to lower your estradiol. So there's other hormones involved as well, like thyroid and um, DHEA, but those, those are really the key kind of quintessential male and female hormones and how they're affected by stress. So I think the elephant in the room is stress and the way we either successfully navigate it or not. Dr. Gottfried, As I understand it, you have had some personal experience with cortisol and stress. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that. (laughs) Yes, I, you know, I joke sometimes that I've had every hormonal problem that I've written about because (laughs) when I was in my mid 30s, I really struggled with many of these issues. So I was a working mother, I was working around the clock as a busy OBGYN, you know, like many women, I had two kids. And I can tell you, sex was the last thing on my mind. I didn't have sexual aversion disorder, but I would rather mop the floor than have sex with my husband. And so when I went to my doctor, which is what a lot of us do, and kind of raised these issues that I was facing, I had weight gain, I had this sense of stress, I had this decreased libido. 
when I raised those with my primary care doctor, he offered me an antidepressant. So that that's what really got me on this path because at first I was humiliated because I didn't feel depressed. I didn't feel like that was addressing the root cause, but then I got angry. You know, that kind of righteous indignation that can start a revolution. So I left his office. I went to the lab and I applied my medical knowledge to myself. I found that my cortisol was three times what it should have been. I had way too much estrogen. I had estrogen dominance. And then I also had a slow thyroid. So yes, I've certainly had a problem with all of these issues that we're talking about. And it seems to me that any one of those hormonal imbalances could put a monkey wrench into sex drive, but put them all together and, hey, it's no wonder you'd rather mop the floor. That's right. It's a perfect storm. And, you know, it's rare that I find a patient who's got low libido who has just one problem. You know, we're complex human beings. We've got, you know, typically more than just one thing going on. And there's also crosstalk between these hormones. So when your cortisol is high, we talked about how that can affect your estrogen and your testosterone levels. It also slows down your thyroid. It also pokes holes in your gut. So, you know, there's, there's many other things that can happen downstream from your hormones being out of whack. Well, you mentioned testosterone. And I think most of our listeners, when they hear about that hormone, they think, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a man thing. That, that's a male hormone. It doesn't have much to do with women. And yet it's my understanding that testosterone is as important to female sex drive as it is to male sex drive. Yes, I totally agree. So the issue with men and women is that the levels of testosterone are much higher in men. So we have, women have 10 to 20 fold decrease levels compared to men. But on the flip side, I would say that we're exquisitely sensitive to those levels. So I think of estrogen as being the hormone that gives us hips and breasts, and it has about 400 jobs in the body. It keeps our genitals um, lubricated. It also is involved in bone strength and other things, cognitive function. But testosterone is incredibly important for women. It's the hormone of confidence, agency, as well as libido. So I think it's very important to be looking at all these different hormonal players, you know, just not not one in isolation, but how are these hormones talking to each other and how are they supporting you? Are they on your team or are they working against you? You're listening to Dr. Sarah Gottfried. She's a Harvard-educated, board-certified gynecologist. As a wife and mother of two teenage daughters, she knows what it's like to feel tired, cranky, chunky, and sometimes overwhelmed. Dr. Gottfried's books include The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. We need to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll find out more about how hormones affect sexual response. Can women as well as men benefit from taking testosterone? We'll also find out about the risks of testosterone therapy. Some women fear that once they go through menopause, they'll no longer have an active sex life. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Dr. Gottfried's root cause analysis can help women get to the bottom of the problem and solve it. She tells us how. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. If you value the health information you get when you listen to The People's Pharmacy, consider subscribing to our email newsletter. You'll get the latest health news and information on upcoming podcasts delivered to your inbox twice a week. Look for the link at peoplespharmacy.com. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. If you would like to purchase a CD of this show, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is 1,137. 
That number again, 800-732-2334, or visit our website. It's peoplespharmacy.com. You can also download the free podcast from iTunes. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by BrainGage, developed by neuroscientists at the University of North Carolina to track brain health. Available for home, research, and clinical applications. Online at gaugeyourbrain.com. Today, we are talking about female sexuality. We recognize that this topic may be somewhat sensitive for some listeners. Parents may wish to take the opportunity to direct the children's attention elsewhere. Our guest is Dr. Sarah Gottfried, a Harvard-educated medical doctor and board-certified gynecologist with more than 25 years of experience. Her books include The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. Dr. Gottfried, I think that um, there's a lot of confusion around hormones in general and testosterone in particular. There for a while, there were television commercials uh, that were sort of highlighting low testosterone levels. Low T, I think, is the way they refer to them. And then the FDA got very excited, and those, t- those commercials seemed to disappear pretty quickly. The FDA basically said, doctors do not prescribe testosterone to men unless they have a real serious condition. Just having low testosterone, that doesn't count. And there are all kinds of warnings about heart attacks and strokes and all, just all kinds of scary stuff around testosterone. I wonder if you have any thoughts about testosterone supplementation for men, especially if they have low T. And then Terry has a question about testosterone supplementation for women. Sure. Well, I think this is one of those situations where the pendulum swings toward testosterone and then away from it. And in part, I think that's in a context of one of the biggest studies that was published on hormones, this time for women, the Women's Health Initiative. So let me talk about that for a moment, then I'll come back to men. Because in 2002, about 23% of American women were taking hormone therapy. And then when the results came out that synthetic hormones, as studied in the Women's Health Initiative, were dangerous and provocative much of the time. It led to millions of women stopping their hormones. And when you say stopping their hormones, you mean stopping estrogen and or progesterone? That's right. So synthetic versions. So what was studied in the Women's Health Initiative was Premarin and Provera. They're kind of, I think of them as the devils we know. So we went from 23% taking hormones to 5%, which I think is too low. I think we actually need to be somewhere in the middle. But the other thing that this did, besides scaring millions of women and getting them off their hormones, is that it made the FDA so sensitive and so fearful of recommending hormone therapy without long-term randomized trials to support the use of it. And so I think we're now living in a post- Women's Health Initiative era, where we don't have enough options, we don't have enough consensus around safe ways to prescribe things like testosterone for men or even testosterone for women. So I think, you know, it's an unfortunate situation. You know, I'm not as current with the literature on low T and men and andropause and the use of testosterone therapy. I certainly have patients who are on it. Um, And my sense is often this comes down to a quality of life decision. And I can tell you, you know, I'm not a fan of men frosting themselves in excessive testosterone. That's never a good idea. But for men who have a low level of testosterone, and that's well documented, and we're getting them back into the physiologic range, I think there's a strong argument to be made for that approach. Let me ask you about testosterone for women, because the FDA has pretty much discouraged its use, and yet my understanding is that for some women, this really can make a difference for a low libido. Has that been your experience, and is there evidence that that's the case? There is evidence. So, you know, I can speak to you from the evidence and from what we know from the scientific literature. And then I can also speak to you as a clinician on the front lines who prescribes testosterone for women. And so in the first category, you're right. The FDA has really 
There's no FDA approved form of testosterone for women. Everything that's FDA approved is for men. And sometimes we, you know, cut patches and do other things to try to make it work for women, but the doses are very high. And so it, it just doesn't translate. And this is based on a few randomized trials. The one that stands out in my mind is one from the Massachusetts General Hospital by Jan Schifrin, where she showed that women after a hysterectomy and after having their ovaries removed, that's you know the clinical situation where your estrogen and your testosterone goes down to a very low level. In those women, if you give them a testosterone patch, they end up having sex about once more per month compared to women not on the testosterone patch. So this study is what made the FDA turn down approval of the testosterone patch for women. This was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and we've really not had a lot of activity since then. Now, the problem is just looking at how often you have intercourse isn't the best measure of a woman's sexual experience. And so this has been kind of a thorny, tricky issue. And clinically, the way that I've dealt with it is to say to my patients, you know, what we're going to do first is we're going to get your hormones back into balance, starting first with estrogen and progesterone and cortisol and thyroid. And then we're going to see where you are with your libido. If you still have decreased libido, and I have ways that I measure that, then we may want to consider adding on some testosterone cream. And I tell them, you know, listen, there's no FDA approved formulation for this. So it means that we're basically involved in an experiment here. But I can also tell you after taking care of 25,000 patients that I have a lot of patients who are on testosterone cream and say that it improves their quality of life. It improves their sex life. It improves their connection with their partner so that the potential risks are worth it. So those risks are things like liver function issues. So I follow liver enzymes every uh, six weeks to 12 weeks on my patients who are taking testosterone. There's also some very limited data that there may be a small increased risk of breast cancer. So we do everything we can from genomics testing to biomarker testing to reduce that risk of breast cancer as low as possible. But those are some of the risks. And it ends up being a quality of life decision that we renegotiate every three to six months when I see them in the office. There, there may be some very specific situations where you would say, well, probably you don't want to take this risk, or are you sure you really want to take this risk? For example, someone who is making her living as a singer um, might not want yes. to risk the possibility that testosterone would change her vocal timbre. That's right. I mean, the voice, the voice lowering effect is one of those risks that is part of informed consent with testosterone therapy. But I can also tell you that with my patients, I'm so careful to make sure that we're in the middle of the physiologic range. And so side effects related to um, what I would call virilizing symptoms. So that's total medical language. Let me translate it for you. So for patients who have a voice lowering effect, that tends to be when you're super physiologic. So you have levels of testosterone that are beyond the normal range. Another um, sign of having too much testosterone is increased size of the clitoris. So, you know, we're watching for those things. It's part of the informed consent. But if you have a patient who's within that physiologic range, the chance of it is very low. Dr. Gottfried, a lot of women are aware that they may experience some changes in sexual function around menopause. But I think that most people have an idea that once you're past menopause, you're not interested in sex anymore that's really not a reasonable assumption, is it? Well, this is such a personal decision, I believe. And I, you know, I'm careful not to take my own values and my own attitude about sex and to project it onto my patients. So certainly I have patients who go through menopause and they have made the decision that the shop is closed. <laughs> uh -huh. But I would say, I would say that's the minority. Most of the patients I'm taking care of, they really see sex not in isolation, but as part of this larger picture of wellness and thriving as you get older. And I certainly see it that way. I think it's, you know, just one facet of all the different systems that we're trying to optimize as you age. 
So I think there's some patients who have that perspective. I think it's in some ways kind of a dated way of looking at it, but I totally respect patients who feel that way. Um, but it's the minority. Now you have said that you prefer to do a root cause analysis. So when someone comes to you and says, Dr. Gottfried, I'm having trouble, how do you proceed? Well, what I do in my office, I practice functional and integrative medicine, and I have a very comprehensive process where I'm looking, you know, not just at hormones, but kind of the bigger picture of everything that is related to libido. And for the patients who are concerned about their sex drive, then that becomes part of the goal setting that we create. And I can tell you, you know, I've done quantitative surveys of my patients. I went to MIT, so I'm a total nerd. So I'm just going to nerd out with you for a moment. We know that 91% of my patients have decreased energy. So that tends to be an important goal for um, my cohort. 80% have decreased libido. Another 80% want to lose weight. And what I often hear is, help me lose 25 pounds, and then I'll focus on my sex drive. Um, another 69% have mood issues or memory issues. So those are that's kind of a, a picture of the kind of patients that I see. And I practice systems-based medicine, where I'm looking at genomics. I'm looking at you know some of the genes that are related to the way that you move hormones and neurotransmitters around in the body. I'm also going to look at the environment. How do you eat, move, think, sleep, connect? And those are really the kind of variables that we're going to be working with together. So I do a comprehensive case review. And the idea is to look at, okay, what are your goals? What are the kind of things that you want to manifest in the next 10, 20, 30 years? And then how do we identify the mechanisms that are maybe out of whack that needs some nudging, that needs some natural medicine to get them back on the straight and narrow. I wonder if you could tell us about somebody, obviously no names attached, that um, came to you for help and and what you did, how, how that went. Sure. A story, a case report, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that comes to mind is a woman, I'll call her Julie. She was 52 years young, and she came to me because she had had outstanding medical care, but she felt flat. So she, she was a designer. You know, she's always had kind of this creative part of her life, but she had just felt like since menopause, which happened at 50, that she didn't have the same vigor. She didn't have the same kind of enthusiasm for life that she used to have. And it translated into less sex drive. She had gone through a divorce and she just couldn't quite bring herself to do online dating and to go down that whole path of sexual connection with someone that she doesn't know very well. So what we did when we went through and looked at her hormonal situation We know in general that about 70% of decreased libido is hormonal. We found that her estrogen was low and it was causing some vaginal dryness and some decreased ability to orgasm. We found that her progesterone was low as well, uh, not surprising. We found that her testosterone was low and we found with her thyroid that she was on uh, Synthroid for years, for about 20 years, at the same dose for 20 years. And her T3 was very low. And T3 is the biologically active form of thyroid hormone. It's the one I think about when it comes to sex drive. So what we did is we got her estrogen, progesterone, and thyroid back into balance. And then I saw her back in about eight weeks. And she came literally skipping into my office (laughs) and said, I am giggly for the first time in five years. Like, I just can't believe. I feel like life is in technicolor again. You know, she really just felt like she had almost this veil over her eyes where she didn't have that same um, enthusiasm, excitement, engagement with life that she had had before. You know, she hardly recognized herself. And so we ended up deciding as she went forward to add a small dose of testosterone cream. And that's where her libido really fell into place. She actually met a new partner. She had a very active sex life. She felt more sexual and connected than she had ever before in her life. And 
she also had some weight loss. She wasn't looking to lose weight, but one of the things that happens with testosterone is that it helps to improve the conversion of the storage thyroid hormone T4 into T3. So she was making more of that free T3 and she was growing her lean body mass. She wasn't bulking up, but she had less fat mass and less and more muscle mass after being on testosterone for three months. So that's a good example. Um, I can give you an example of an older woman if you'd like. I would love that. So I have another woman that I'm thinking of, also an artist, who came to me at about 73. And she had been on hormone therapy prescribed by another gynecologist. And that gynecologist had suggested that she come off of the hormone therapy. And that's from the Women's Health Initiative. You know, this is kind of a blanket recommendation that there's a window of opportunity for women to take hormones, that it's typically from about 50 to 60 or until 10 years after you go through um, menopause, your final menstrual period. And so she was coming to me for advice. And she also felt like sexuality had been such an important part of her long-term marriage. She had been married for about 30 years, and she just... She was afraid to come off the hormone therapy. She just felt like, you know, it was such an important quality of life indicator for her to feel that sexual connection with her husband. So we ended up doing genomic testing. So looking at her genes, looking at her risk of heart disease and stroke and breast cancer and all these other things that we think about with hormone therapy. And we made a very careful, deliberate decision to continue on hormone therapy, not at the same dose that she had taken, but at a three-quarters dose. And I think that's an important point, too, because a lot of people get stuck into this question of, should I take hormone therapy, yes or no? And I I think the question is much more nuanced. Um, We're at a point now where we can really customize and tailor the dose so that it's right for the individual person. So she she ended up staying on this hormone therapy, uh, bioidentical estrogen and oral progesterone, which I give as Prometrium, and I use uh, Vivel patch for estradiol. And she stayed on this three-quarters dose, and we also used some local estrogen just to make sure, in the vagina, to make sure that she had the kind of lubrication she needed with this lower dose of systemic estrogen. And that's what she needed to just really, you know, feel that kind of yummy, sexual connection with her husband. And that's what she continues on to this day, aware of the risks and benefits, but really making a quality of life decision. You're listening to Dr. Sarah Gottfried, a board-certified gynecologist practicing functional and integrative medicine. She's the author of The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. After the break, we'll learn about sexual side effects, especially when it comes to drugs for mood disorders. How can doctors help patients who've been taking antidepressants for a long time? Are aphrodisiacs real? Are there any natural products that can improve libido? What can be done for vaginal dryness that interferes with sexual enjoyment? This problem is not limited to menopause. Oral contraceptives can also cause vaginal discomfort as a side effect. You are listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. If you're enjoying this People's Pharmacy podcast, why not head over to our website where you'll find a wealth of information on medications, conditions, home remedies, and ways to keep yourself healthy. You'll find it all at peoplespharmacy.com. <laughs> Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. To purchase a CD of today's show or any People's Pharmacy broadcast, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is 1137 That number again, 800-732-2334. You can also download the free podcast from iTunes or from our web store. We invite you to consider writing a review. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Brain Gauge, developed by neuroscientists at the University of North Carolina to track brain health. Available for home, research, and clinical applications. Online at gaugeyourbrain.com. Today we're discussing women's health issues, particularly with regard to sexuality. 
we're talking about clinical problems that may not be suitable for young listeners. Many medications can interfere with libido and sexual satisfaction. Are people warned about such side effects when they get a prescription? Our guest is Dr. Sarah Gottfried. She's a board-certified gynecologist with more than 25 years of experience. Her books include The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. Dr. Gottfried, you mentioned that when you went to your family physician with some of the problems that you were experiencing, the answer was an antidepressant. And you also mentioned that some of your patients come in with mood disorders. And I suspect that a lot of healthcare professionals would prescribe an antidepressant for someone who complained of feeling down in the dumps. The only trouble with those drugs is that they have a fairly high rate of sexual dysfunction. Uh, For men, it may be an inability to achieve orgasm, but that may be true for women as well, and it may also lower libido. So can you give us uh, your perspective on many of the medications that are prescribed that have this perhaps unexpected and undiscussed? I mean, this is not something a lot of health professionals like to talk about. Oh, I'm, I'm prescribing you Prozac, and by the way, it might ruin your love life. How do you deal with that? I love this question. So I, you know, I I think if you look at the most unbiased data on antidepressants and their role in depression, what you find is that they're often worse than placebo in terms of effectiveness for mild to moderate depression. For severe depression, I think that you can make an argument to prescribe, but the majority of patients that I see have mild to moderate depression, and I think they have no business being prescribed an antidepressant. I think they, they need lifestyle medicine. They need treatments that are designed to help them with the level of inflammation in their body, which is at the root of why they feel depressed. So, you know, we, we live in an era with a broken healthcare system, if I step back for a moment, and I know because I trained within it, so I'm trained as a traditional physician, and it's a it's an era of a pill for every ill. And I think we found that this strategy has failed. We need a different strategy. We know that about 70% of healthcare costs are lifestyle related, and I think mood is a really good example. So if we just... If we just look at the hormonal drivers of mood for a moment, we know that about 50% of people who are depressed have high cortisol levels. Is that being checked by every primary care doctor who sees a patient who complains of depression? No. We know that about 20% of patients with depression have a low thyroid uh, function. And that is tested a little more often, but, you know, I, I think it's. To me, it's crucial to do a root cause analysis when you have a patient with a mood issue and to look at what I consider in women at least to be the hormonal Charlie's angels, to look at cortisol, to look at thyroid, and to look at estrogen. So for so many women, well, for all women, estrogen is the master regulator. And when you start to make less of it, beginning in your 40s, sometimes in your 50s, it can cause mood issues. And so to me, the first treatment should be to get those hormones back into balance, not to reach for the Prozac or some other antidepressant. So you're right. I mean, I wish that every patient was given full informed consent about the adverse risks of being prescribed an antidepressant. I think we unfortunately just live in a time where the average appointment with a a doctor in the U.S. is seven minutes, and it's often faster and quicker to prescribe the Prozac or whatever, Celexa, whatever the new antidepressant is, rather than to really get to the root cause. Well, I'm suspecting that you have a number of patients who have come in your office, and after you get done talking with them, and eventually they say, well, yeah, I am having some libido issues and, and sex isn't like it used to be. You find out that, yeah, they're taking Cymbalta or they're taking Celexa or they're taking Lexapro or fill in the blank. There are a dozen of them. And millions or tens of millions of people are relying on these medications on a daily basis, whether they're helpful or not. How do you how do you interact with a patient who is complaining of sexual dysfunction but has been on an antidepressant for months or years? 
Well, we know we know from the best statistics that one in four American women over the age of 40 has taken an antidepressant. And that's the number is double in my practice. So about half of my patients come in taking an antidepressant. So what I do is I'm not someone who immediately removes every pharmaceutical that a patient is taking. I don't think that serves them well. But what we want to do is take a look at, okay, what's happening with your body right now? What's working well? What, what's some of the intelligent design that we can enhance? What's happening with your hormones? And could we start to naturally balance those hormones? And once you start feeling better, start to withdraw the antidepressant. So there's some antidepressants that you can stop and not have dramatic withdrawal symptoms from. There are others uh, where that's far less the case, such as Lexapro. And so I have a strategy that I use with balancing hormones and also, you know, not just the hormones, but what's happening in terms of your nutrients. Are you eating the foods that support a good mood? Are you getting the exercise that you need, which I think is one of the best forms of antidepressant. I think of it not as, you know, some, it's good for your heart, but it's also incredibly good for your mood. You know, what about your connection with others? Are you socially isolated? Do you have purpose and meaning? So it's, to me, it's a much broader context from which to discuss whether someone should continue taking an antidepressant. And similar to what I said about taking hormones, it's not a yes-no answer. It's more, okay, you've been taking the Cymbalta for 10 years. How do you feel on it? What were you like before? Have you gained weight? What can we do to support you better? What are your goals? Do you want to get off of it? You know, I'm not just going to project my own views about antidepressant onto all of my patients. So that gives you a little flavor, I hope, of how I approach this in my practice. Absolutely. Um, you, you have mentioned root cause analysis. So I'm guessing that all of these things go into your root cause analysis? Yes, definitely. You know, I, I start with food. <laughs> and it's, I feel like food is such important information for your body. I don't think of it as calories. I don't think of it as, you know, fuel. I think of it as information for your DNA. Tell us so, a bit more about that, if you would, please. Sure. Well, you know, I think if you look at an ancestral health perspective, we had a certain way of eating in our Paleolithic times that was a good match for our DNA, and what's happened in the past, especially 100 years, is that the way that we've eaten has dramatically completely changed. Now, that's also along with the change that we talked about earlier with stress, with high perceived stress. And the two kind of are in lockstep. So I'm a big fan of starting first with someone's diet. And that doesn't ma it doesn't matter whether they're coming to see me because of decreased libido or they're coming to see me because they want to reduce their risk of breast cancer or um, they're having menopausal symptoms and can't sleep at night. It doesn't really matter what the chief complaint is. What matters is, you know, this kind of systems based analysis starting first with food. So I want to know where are your nutrients coming from. When are you eating? What are you eating? Whom are you eating with? And how can we take where you are right now and make sure that you're getting the nutrients that you need, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, the copper, zinc, selenium, magnesium, all the things that you need to be able to function at your fullest? Well, speaking of food and perhaps moving um, in that same direction towards natural approaches, we've interviewed herbalists and ethnobotanists, and sometimes they talk about well, let's call it what it is, aphrodisiacs from nature. And I'm just wondering, in your experience, are there any natural products that can enhance sexual function? You know, my best friend from medical school is a an expert in aphrodisiacs. <laughs> and she talks about things like oysters and chocolate. Unfortunately, I don't know the science on them, but I, I can tell you, you know, if you just look at something like oysters... It's one of the richest sources of certain minerals that many of us are deficient in, like copper and zinc. And so I think probably these aphrodisiacs that have stood the test of time have certain benefits in the body that we may or may not be aware of. So I'm not familiar with the proof, but this is one of those situations where lack of proof is not proof against. 
Let me ask you about uh, sexual function and specifically as it relates to vaginal dryness or pain during intercourse, two different but related topics. What can be done for that? You know, this is one of the easiest fixes we have. So for women, you know, estrogen has about 300, 400 jobs in the body. And one of the jobs is to keep your mucosa uh, juicy and lubricated. So that's true in the vagina. It's true in your bladder. It's true in your joints. So many women have the phenotype, you know, kind of the genes interacting with their environment that leads to vaginal dryness as their estrogen drops below a certain level. So as I said, this is a really easy thing to fix. The thing that is FDA approved that I tend to start with first is to use estradiol cream. I also use the S-ring, and that's something that's been shown to be safe in patients who are breast cancer survivors because the level of estrogen is more predictable. I have colleagues who prescribe other things such as DHEA cream or a cocktail of estradiol plus testosterone in the vagina. I tend not to do that. I tend to go more with what's FDA approved. But this is one of those situations where you give a woman a prescription for estradiol cream and within two weeks, she's going to notice a dramatic change. So I really encourage our patients who are listening to talk to their doctors if they have vaginal dryness. You know, it shouldn't be the sort of thing that you suffer in silence about. And I also want to say, you know, I I do have patients before menopause. And one of the most common situations I see in my practice is women who come to me in their 20s and 30s and even early 40s who are taking a birth control pill and they have vaginal dryness as a result of taking the pill. That happens in about 20% of birth control pill users. So that's another situation where I think it's important to be aware of the hormonal downstream effects of taking something like an oral contraceptive. What can be done for that? Well, I try to switch those women to a different form of contraception that's not hormonal. Mm -hmm. I think the birth control pill is the number one source of um, hormone disorders in the U.S. And, you know, a lot of women don't realize that up to 20% also can have shrinkage of their clitoris with the birth control pill. So I try to get women off the birth control pill. It can take a year or longer for the hormones to get back to normal. In particular, what happens is this uh, intermediary called the sex hormone binding globulin that goes up when you go on the birth control pill, and it basically soaks up all the free testosterone you have in your body, and that leads to the vaginal dryness. So it can take a while to get things back into the normal range again. Dr. Gottfried, we have heard from some women who have said, vaginal dryness, I take care of that by lubricating with coconut oil or olive oil. Is that something your patients have reported to you? Yes, they certainly have. I mean, the thing you have to be cautious of, I have to, you know, put on sort of my careful doctor hat here. You have to be careful with using condoms because oils like coconut oil and olive oil can cause problems with the thickness of the condom. But I think that's actually a really good choice for many women who are looking for lubrication and looking for something natural, something that's not petroleum based. And the other benefit to coconut oil is that it's antifungal. So you're, you're kind of uh, solving two problems at once. Dr. Gottfried, we also get questions from women who say, well, how would I do that? Olive oil, uh, coconut oil, um, it doesn't come from the pharmacy with an applicator. It doesn't come with an applicator, but you have applicators at the tips of your fingers, as it were. Yes, and it's, you know, if we, can we talk about the vagina for a moment? Let's do. (laughs) So if you look at the vagina, which I do all day long, It's only the lower third of the vagina that has the estrogen receptors that we want to be thinking about. So that's where the dryness is. The dryness tends to be right at the opening, which in gynecology speak, we call the introitus, and the lower third of the vagina. So you're absolutely right, Terry, that it's, you know, if you use a finger just to apply it to the opening and to the lower third, you're covered. Dr. Gottfried, in summing up your message to our listeners today who may be feeling frustrated about 
what can I do? I, I'm, I'm 55 and my sex life is over. What are the possibilities? Well, I feel for that woman because I'm 51 and I know what it's like to feel like this part of your life is dying. And what I want everyone to hear is that this is your choice. So if you want to have a um, exciting, enthusiastic, you know, swinging from the chandeliers some of the time, sex life as you get older, it is entirely within your power. So I believe that what you may need to do is to work with a collaborative clinician who can help get you there, who can do the root cause analysis, who can get your hormones where they need to be, who can help you with, you know, the connection in your relationship, which is another huge piece that we haven't even talked about. So I would say it's entirely within your power. Don't give up. Don't turn your power over to some doctor who only has seven minutes and has a hand on the door as you bring up the issue of libido. Dr. Sarah Gottfried, thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. My pleasure. You've been listening to Dr. Sarah Gottfried. She's a Harvard-educated medical doctor and board-certified gynecologist with more than 25 years of experience. She's found that an integrative approach often works well to manage this type of problem. Her books include The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. Joe, Dr. Gottfried was talking about the importance of relationships, and I think that's worth emphasizing. Absolutely. And it's also important to find a health professional who can talk with you about your considerations. Absolutely. Lynn Siegel produced today's show, Al Wadarski engineered, Dave Graydon edits our interviews. The People's Pharmacy is produced at the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. The People's Pharmacy theme music is by B.J. Lederman. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Brain Gauge, developed by neuroscientists at the University of North Carolina to track brain health. Available for home, research, and clinical applications online at gaugeyourbrain.com. If you'd like to purchase a CD of today's show or any other People's Pharmacy broadcast, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is number 1137. The number again, 800-732-2334, or find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. When you visit our site, you can share your thoughts about today's show. Have you ever experienced sexual side effects from a medication? Please share your story in the comment section for today's show. At peoplespharmacy.com, you can also sign up for our free online newsletter or subscribe to the free podcast of the show. When you sign up for the newsletter, you get our free e-guide to favorite home remedies. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please consider taking a minute to write a review on iTunes. And thanks for listening to The People's Pharmacy.